So again, I am here to talk to you about cultivating an incest taboo in the workplace. The series is Chicago's best ideas, but this is not one of Chicago's ideas at all, uh, let alone one of mine. It's one of Margaret Mead's. Um, and it's one that she uh, first put forth, not in a scholarly article, but in Red Book magazine in 1978. Uh, and what she said, uh, acknowledging that the Equal Pay Act and that Title VII, which prohibited sex discrimination in the workplace, had done an awful lot to improve the employment uh, opportunities of men and women and to integrate the workplace by sex, she said, that's not enough. She said, new laws will not be sufficient to protect women, and men too for that matter, uh, from the problem of sexual harassment on the job. We need new taboos. Uh, and that's all a, a direct quote from, uh, from Margaret Mead. Uh, I've agreed with her since I first entered legal academia in the, in the 1990s. Uh, it took me much longer to write this up because I was uh, discouraged from doing so by, uh, among others, some of the feminist theory uh, and queer theory circles in which I hung out. And I will talk a bit about some of the criticisms of this proposal that famous feminists and queer, queer theorists ha have made. Uh, but again, I have always found this uh, proposal attractive. And I'm going to spell out a little how I understand the proposal and how it fits into uh, what I'm interested in. Uh, and one of the things I'm interested in is uh, a broader project of, with apologies for not using the scientific term precisely scientifically correctly, uh, I call a unified field theory of the treatment of liking and not liking in the law of employment discrimination, uh, a theory that accounts for both sexual and non-sexual forms of attraction between decision makers in the workplace uh, and those they have the power to hire, to fire, or to uh, promote. Uh, now, the analogy that Mead raises to familial incest, I think, has several uh, operative uh, features. Uh, the first is uh, that um, these taboos are often embodied in law, but they don't principally rely on legal enforcement, uh, but on internalized social norms uh, for their power. So if you think about uh, you know, the reason most parents uh, don't initiate sex with their children is not because they would go to jail uh, if they were to do so. Um, you know, people sometimes say that the very existence of a taboo stimulates the uh, forbidden uh, desire. Uh, but I think that for most parents, their children are simply not thought of as uh, sex objects. Uh, in the short article I wrote, um, I said, you know, think about the analogies uh, of three kinds of um, roaches, right? The thought of consuming cockroaches is disgusting. The thought of consuming marijuana roaches is appealing but potentially prohibited. Um, I think that um, not having sex with your children is a little more like not consuming hemp fiber. Uh, it's not disgusting to consume hemp fiber, but we just don't think of it as food. And it may be uh, a little bit uh, much to ask that we also not think of, uh, of the people we uh, supervise in the workplace as available uh, to us sexually. But I think that's what Mead and I uh, are both arguing for. Now, just to be clear how far uh, I at least take this argument, um, no incest taboo I'm aware of anywhere in the world or anywhere in recorded history categorically prohibits sex between family members. In most states in the United States, it's legal to marry your first cousin. In many countries and cultures around the world, first cousins are the ideal marriage partners. But what almost what, what every incest taboo I am aware of does prohibit is ancestor descendant sex. Uh, and similarly, what I would want to carry over in the workplace is uh, a taboo on people in a direct reporting relationship with one another. Now, some queer theorists would say, oh, you're you know, imposing an egalitarian standard, and sometimes hierarchy can be sexy. Sure. But I am not talking about a, I mean, you know, some people find it sexy, uh, they don't, but hey. Um, but direct reporting relationship means on the same totem pole, right? If you are into uh, sex with someone who is uh, you know, much older, more powerful, uh, much younger, and less powerful, then just find them um, in a different uh, reporting relationship on a, on a different totem pole. The second kind of incest taboo that's very often uh, 
incorporated is one uh, between siblings. Uh, and again, you might imagine that some kinds of close working relationships are analogous to sibling relationships. But I would be um, happy enough if this were um, instituted with respect to direct reporting relationships. Um, and uh, there is a, a history of this, not um, in the context I'm most interested in, which is preventing sex discrimination, but in the context of um, encouraging the good functioning of workplaces. Um, and anti-nepotism rules and anti-fraternization rules are examples of this. Uh, and two environments in which this uh, has happened over long history uh, are the military on the one hand uh, and Catholic monasteries and convents uh, on the other. So what the military has long prohibited is what it calls fraternization. Um, and these days, fraternization is very often seen as sexual, but it needn't be. So bans on fraternization prevent officers from uh, doing everything, not only from having sex, but also from, uh, from gambling, from going into business with, from doing other things uh, with people under their command that may disturb the, the command structure. And similarly, the Catholic Church has long had a prohibition on what it calls particular friendships. Uh, and these days, again, uh, when people talk about the Catholic ban on particular friendships, they tend to focus on homosexuality in uh, the convent or the monastery. Uh, just like when one talks about fraternization, one these days talks about heterosexuality in the chain of command. But that's not what it was originally all about. Similarly, in the monastery, the idea is that the relationship between a superior and the persons that superior supervises should be more or less equal. So if the abbot is really close to one of the monks, whether in um, a sexual or a non-sexual uh, way, that disturbs the relationship uh, he can have uh, with the rest uh, of, uh, of the monastery. Uh, and for me, this gets to uh, one of the ways in which this is problematic uh, under, uh, under Title VII, uh, which is, and, and also gets to some of the objections that um, queer theorists may have. So one queer theorist who is really not happy uh, with an idea of an incest taboo in the workplace is Janet Halley uh, at Harvard. Uh, and one of her objections is that um, third party bystanders can bring complaints and are uh, perhaps more likely to do so uh, if the relationship is an untraditional one uh, of one kind or another. I have a hard time seeing most of the people that Janet sees as third parties as in fact third parties for reasons I'm going to explain. Uh, before I do, let me say a third feature um, that um, I think is uh, important to the analogy to familial incest, and it's a controversial one, uh, is that I think that the purpose of an incest taboo, among other things, is to create a safe space. I realize safe space is a dangerous word to use uh, at the University of Chicago, but a, a, a space that is free from sexual threat or possibility. Um, that's not the space of the relationship or the family, but it's the space, it, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's not the space of the workplace or the family, but it's the space of the relationship between the supervisor and the, and the supervisee. Um, and here's why I think that there uh, are fewer third parties than uh, Janet Halley uh, might think. Uh, it's now back in the news, so it's not reaching that far into the past if I ask you to think about the Clinton-Lewinsky relationship. The relationship between Clinton and Lewinsky was not itself sexual harassment, right? She made perfectly clear that she was a willing participant. This was not unwelcome. She also benefited rather more than she was harmed from the relationship. She went from being an unpaid intern to getting a paid job to getting advice from Fern and Jordan. So from the perspective of Title VII, which prohibits sexual harassment in the workplace uh, and prohibits it in largely two broad categories. The first is so-called quid pro quo harassment. Um, you know, when I taught at the University of Virginia uh, and I used to send around the annual memo saying sexual harassment training, uh, one of my colleagues would joke, okay, fine, we need to do sexual harassment training. Repeat after me, 
I will give you an A if you have sex with me. That's an example of being trained to do quid pro quo harassment. Uh, the specific exchange of sexual favors for workplace benefits. The second kind of harassment is hostile environment. There's, uh, and there are many different kinds of hostile environment. Um, we're talking to some extent about both kinds of harassment uh, when we're talking about liability uh, in the face of there not being an incest uh, taboo. Coming back to Clinton Lewinsky, she's neither a victim of quid pro quo harassment, nor is she a victim of hostile environment harassment. And, uh, and, but what about what Janet Halley would call the third parties? Well, again, think about the Clinton White House. Uh, it was a place in which, honestly, uh, one of the heads of personnel would shunt attractive women away from the Oval Office lest Clinton hit on them. Uh, in many other workplaces, possibly also in the Clinton White House, uh, attractive women would be shunted toward the decision maker so that he could hit on that. What, so this affects the employment opportunities, not just of those attractive women, either positively or negatively, but unattractive women and men. Um, so it's hard to see who the third party is. Um, and it's on that theory uh, that I think that the EEOC is right uh, to develop its guidelines on sexual favoritism in the workplace. Uh, interesting footnote, they were de developed under the EEOC, EEOC chairmanship of one Clarence Thomas, who if anybody uh, knows what happens to a workplace when sexual themes are introduced, probably does know. So that I'm summarizing the sexual favoritism um, guidelines, but they basically say it's not necessarily a problem if uh, it's not necessarily a problem under Title VII. It, it can have be other kinds of problems, like it can violate nepotism rules for an employer to favor the particular person he or she is involved with, his or her paramour. Why is that? Because no one else in the whole world of any sex would have a chance at the job. It's not sex discrimination. But it possibly is sex discrimination and actionable under Title VII if an employer systematically favors those people he is sexually attracted to. Now, those people themselves might have a hostile environment claim or a quid pro quo claim, depending on how he, and I'll use the term he just for convenience sake, um, uh, he manifests that attraction, but the people who don't have a chance at the job because the employer isn't attracted to them might have a claim for sex discrimination. Now, I said this fit into what I think of as a unified field theory of liking and not liking in the workplace. Um, and the fact that it does for me is what sets me apart from another feminist theorist who doesn't like the idea of an incest taboo, and that's Vicki Schultz at Yale University. Uh, who has basically uh, deplored the way in which eroticism has been moved out of the workplace. And I, I keep pressing her to say something more in the Harvey Weinstein era than she said in her early articles uh, around the turn of the millennium, uh, where what she was saying is, you know, there really has to be a way for men and women to work together uh, that doesn't uh, end up with, with nothing but taboos, that, that, that allows them uh, to uh, express their eroticism and their attraction uh, on the job. To which my response is uh, riffing off the sexual favoritism guidelines. I mean, and she said, you know, she also said, why is sex so special, right? Uh, you know, bosses have all kinds of other ways of, she didn't use this term, but fraternizing with their employees, uh, going out to golf games or basketball games, playing the golf, watching the basketball, um, and that's not seen as a problem. To which my response is, well, maybe it should be. Again, it's a unified field theory of liking and not liking in the law of discrimination. And again, I'm not interested in the good functioning of the workplace and the kind of thing that nepotism rules get at. I'm interested in employment opportunity regardless of sex. And so what I say is, just as hiring your particular friend may not be a violation of Title VII, um, and hiring your particular paramour may not be a violation of Title VII, 
if you're the kind of person that can only make friends with other straight, white, Anglo-Saxon Christian males, then suddenly hiring your friends potentially is a Title VII problem. And if you're the kind of person that can only be sexually attracted to uh, one sort of person, uh, then that too might present Title VII problems to someone who isn't that kind of person. Now one of the um, odd features of um, what I'm arguing for is that um, it turns what those of you who may have taken employment discrimination law uh, can think of as the boogaboo of employment discrimination law, the bisexual harasser. Now, what can we do with a bisexual harasser? I mean, and courts have spent a lot of time saying, well, you know, they harass people differently depending on their genitalia, so it's still sex specific. So the bisexual harasser turns out potentially to be a solution and not a problem. Uh, in this world because uh, it, there's an early um, theorist called Richard Wasserstrom who tries to do analogies between sex and race and says, well, one of the differences between sex and race is that people are typically uh, not perfectly bisexual. They are attracted to people on the basis of sex and the fact that that is so means we can't be sex blind uh, even to the extent we can imagine uh, being race blind. Well, if there really were a perfectly bisexual harasser, he might have problems or she might have problems with nepotism requirements or fraternization requirements, but the one thing he or she might not be doing is engaging in sex discrimination in the workplace uh, in any event. Um, I'll stop there for the moment uh, and ask for questions, interventions, uh, I ask my class for all the time expressions of outrage uh, or puzzlement um, at this proposal, which again, not mine, but Margaret Mead's, but I think is a great proposal and to be encouraged, especially now in this time of Harvey Weinstein and Me Too, for a number of reasons, including that other kinds of remedies than the internalized social taboo are less readily available in environments like the entertainment industry when um, reporting relationships are not necessarily employment relationships actionable under something like Title VII. Okay, yes? Uh, I just um, kind of had a question about the assumption that, um, that having sex with children or parents isn't necessarily disgusting, rather than we just don't view those people as sex objects, because I think, and maybe this is just pop science, but I think that um, maybe we evolved to view uh, sex with direct ancestors as disgusting because it was evolutionary useful. Because I mean, I think that, I mean, my assumption was that that is the reason that the taboo exists is because we find that repulsive. And you say that that's not the reason. No, I, I, I wasn't making a causal claim. I was making a descriptive claim about present day parents. I could be wrong about this descriptive claim, but I, I do think that most people who choose not to have sex with children do not have a process of aversion and repulsion, but, but you know, sort of bypass that. I'm not saying that they wouldn't be disgusted if they were forced to think about it. I'm saying that the process isn't, you know, again, the analogy being eating cockroaches and eating hemp. And I choose eating cockroaches advisedly because my colleagues Martha Nussbaum and Cass Sunstein have spent a fair amount of time and energy dis describing in their uh, work on disgust uh, the question of whether people should overcome their evolutionarily primed uh, revulsion at eating cockroaches through reason. And they have all these hypotheticals about um, you know, uh, perfectly sterile cockroaches in ice cubes and why won't people touch them. So it's that that I had in mind. Is that yeah. helpful? Uh, yeah, and maybe it just leads to my, I mean, uh, I think you'll probably get to this later in the presentation, but the logistics of how you establish this well, I mean, I don't think the law is irrelevant. I think, for example, and the law um, with respect to Title VII, and then also the rules that an individual employer uh, sets up. 
Um, but again, I think you know, sexual harassment more generally is a fine example of how where we are as a culture is not totally independent of where the law would take us, but is not totally dependent either on, on where the law should take us. And the fact that we have things like sexual harassment training, uh, although I think we should call it anti-harassment training, uh, has made a, a big difference. Um, and the reason why people may not uh, engage in certain behavior that would be might have been perfectly acceptable uh, several generations ago is not, they don't necessarily go through, I mean, they might, some of them, but they don't necessarily go through the process. If I do this, I'll be sued. If I'm sued, I'll lose my job or my company. They just think I shouldn't be doing this, which is how taboos work. Yes? Yeah, I guess to go off that, <coughs> excuse me. I was, I guess I'm just wondering about the transmittal of the taboo and where you see that actually happening. And if, I mean, I guess, I'm, you know, cause or effect of the law, I mean, I wonder if laws against certain taboos are a result of the, of the taboo rather than creating the taboo, or maybe it's both. But also, you know, the kind of, the evolution we've had the behavior in the 1950s at work is obviously would be abhorrent to us now, or at least a lot of us now, but I don't know if it would be disgusting. It would just seem wrong. And I, don't, I guess I'm just wondering how that can settle work. So, yeah, it's disgusting maybe in the eye of the beholder. I mean, you know, again, the reason of all the topics I could choose, although it's not one I'm uh, currently actively working on, I chose this one, is because of the Harvey Weinstein and the, the Me Too moment. And um, I think it's worth reflecting on the fact that um, Harvey Weinstein is, for better or for worse, seen to be objectively disgusting. Uh, I'm not saying that it is better or worse to be harassed by someone who is more conventionally attractive in any sense of the word attractive than Harvey Weinstein. But you know, I'll note that Harvey Weinstein is someone uh, about whom there were jokes for years about having to pretend to be attracted to him. Because other than the fact that he is powerful, he has none of the indicia in terms of physical attractiveness or good grooming or good behavior that's associated with attractiveness. So, you know, the, the fat, old, powerful man chasing the um, attractive secretary around the desk, and if you look at New Yorker cartoons from the 1930s, you'll see a whole lot of them, was probably seen as disgusting by everyone other than the fat, old, powerful man at all times through um, recorded history. Um, but we're now seeing, you know, so so many of the people in the Me Too generation of perpetrators are saying, I thought it was welcome, right? You know, Charlie Rose, Garrison Keillor. Um, one thing a taboo might do is to discourage them from thinking it's welcome. Um, Yes. I guess uh, just to maybe put it in the law firm context, because a lot of us will be going to places yeah. like that. There's obviously like some direct reporting relationships, but then there are a lot of informal relationships that exist. Whether that's like a company assigned mentor or a partner with whom you may be working at some point but not later. I was wondering how you think those sort of informal or transient relationships should be affected by the assessment. It's, it's a very difficult, very complicated, very good question. And I'll say, I first encountered it, uh, you know, first encountered you know, reporters actually asking me about this uh, when I was a faculty member at the University of Virginia, which I was for much of the 1990s. And the University of Virginia was one of the earliest, certainly public and possibly universities of any kind, categorically to prohibit sex between professors and undergraduates. And the very difficult question was what do you do between uh, consensual sexual relationships between faculty and graduate students? And I think it's worth mentioning that we were talking about Charlottesville, Virginia, a town of 40,000 in a um, county of, at that point, around 80,000. And if, you know, no wonder professors and graduate students end up, uh, professors and graduate students in the same field 
end up in relationships with one another, uh, relationships that often lead to marriage and children, you know, you tend to be, I mean, leaving aside other cri criteria for attractiveness, shared interests are high on the list. And in a town that small, you may not find anyone uh, to share your uh, esoteric uh, academic interests. And so the, the, the problem is that both the strongest positive attraction and the most harm can be done in these more informal uh, reporting relationships. Um, and I hate to say it depends, but I think I, I'll come back to what I said about ordinary familial incest taboos. Other than ancestor def descendant, you know, uncle niece, right? Uh, uncle niece, lots of people find, I mean, even first cousins, some people find disgusting. I mean, when Rudy Giuliani um, ran for president, there were some people who were upset with him on, for having cheated on his second wife with his third wife. There were some people who were still upset with him that his first wife was his first cousin. Um, but so it's the point, what you are signaling, that is to say these informal supervisory relationships are both the point of greatest promise and the point of greatest risk. And I would probably look first to the military for a model um, where the chain of command is what they focus on and start with that um, as an entry point. Yes? With respect to the value of the incest taboo, creating this safe space, Mm -hmm. It's easy for me to understand the value of that space um, in a sexual context. Yep. I'm having a harder time understanding the need for that space in a non-sexual context. Like, why does the monk need to be protected from from a friendship with the act? Well, it's not the monk who needs to be protected. It's not the monk who has the friendship with the abbot that is needs to be protected. It's the rest of the monastery. It's again what it does. It's favoritism, nepotism, and again, sex discrimination. If or race discrimination or religion, you know, ancestry discrimination. If the person the superior pals around with is identifiable on what Title VII calls a forbidden ground, right? If it's not identifiable on a forbidden ground, if it's just an individual personal relationship, uh, you know. The term unit cohesion in the military has come into very bad odor because it's used categorically to keep out people like gay soldiers and trans soldiers. But there is something to be said for unit cohesion. And one of the reasons fraternization is prohibited and has long been prohibited by the US military is to promote unit cohesion. So again, it's less the individual um, who's in the particular friendship than the rest of the monastery either the individuals in the monastery who may not have the same kind of chances, or the functioning of the monastery, which may not be as smooth, is the way the theory goes. Yes? Yeah, I was just, just going to offer some anecdotes on the military part uh, for both of those. So, uh, anecdotes. This is the University of Chicago. We don't do anecdotes, right? We do data. <laughs> No, I mean, I'm, I'm somebody who thinks that sometimes anecdote is the plural. I mean, sorry, data is the plural of anecdote, but go ahead. Uh, I think the, the, the original way in which this anti fraternization norm came up was especially with commanders who have to pick someone for the most dangerous mission. And so <laughs> it has, if, if you have a special friendship or relationship with one of your support, not the other one, the other one's much more likely to get sent off to die in combat. Um, and that has morphed now in a romantic context to where if two people are in a romantic relationship, clearly you're not going to send your significant other off to die if you're going to have someone else to do that. Um, and if people are in a triangle, you are more, I mean, this goes, you, you can quote the Hebrew Bible for this proposition, you know, David sent Uriah to be killed uh, because he wanted to marry Uriah's wife. Yeah. Um, but on the, on the norm creation, um, so if, so, uh, I went to the Naval Academy where we first admitted women in 1976, and uh, so they had to come up with these norms because everybody lives together and everybody's in a close environment, and uh, the students are divided up into companies, and there's a very specific rule that is instilled in you from the day you're there, which is you don't date anyone in your company. And I 
know that this works because my roommate is now married to a woman in our company, <laughs> and I'm still comfortable. Ah. Every single time I, I uh, hang out with them, even though I'm also married to a former officer, and I don't see, like, I can't identify what the problem. I mean, we, we haven't been in that company in 15 years. We don't work together at all. There's no reason. But it's only a 30-year-old norm, and it's still, I still think it's easy. fascinating. Yeah, and but you you've um, thank you for the supportive anecdote. But the but the but the problematic part of it, of course, is that family relationships don't change as often as reporting relationships do, uh, and that probably needs to be taken into account. Yes. So, uh, I have a question about sort of the effectiveness of uh, a person's with taboo. It, it seems to me that. In the context of the Me Too movement, um, it's not so much an absence, uh, a prior absence of that kind of taboo, but the fact of certain people escaping that taboo. So Bill Clinton, Harvey Weinstein are both men who had power structures around them such that nobody was ever going to tell them that what they were doing was disgusting. Oh, I think a lot of people told Bill Clinton in real time. Maybe. That he listened is another question. Well, but and then, and then part two, right? That no one was ever going to be able to do anything about it. I, I, I think it is very true that many people around Bill Clinton were disgusted, right? That that taboo did exist, but was ineffective against the individual perpetrator. Um, and while we're speaking of anecdotes, I myself was a White House intern. I was, in fact, a 22 year old female White House intern, um, which led to some interesting jokes being made by my friends and family. However, <laughs> Um, I can say that in the Obama administration, the rule was so strict that uh, interns were not allowed unescorted into the West Wing. And that, I think, speaks to, I mean, of course, an after effect of, of the Lewinsky scandal, but I think also speaks to the ability of an individual president, an individual leader of an organization, being able to set rules that do or do not allow that kind of organization to occur, right? And again, it's this question not just of, like, what does everybody else think, but what does the one guy think, and what is he able to do about it? Yeah, and so first of all, let me um, riff off of, of what for you might have been a minor part of the story. Um, interns can't go unescorted into the West Wing. So one of the things that people like Vicki Schultz say in opposition to such a policy is that it will uh, adversely affect women's employment opportunities because, uh, as has happened, uh, according to survey information at her own home institution, Yale Law School, uh, faculty will not want to be uh, alone behind a closed door with a woman, even a woman that they are mentoring, if they are male. Um, and you know, similarly, will be un will be less likely to offer informal mentoring opportunities to women. My response is, I think exactly the opposite is true. It is only in the presence of an effective taboo, for example, that we are willing to leave adults alone with children. Um, it is only because we have some confidence that even behind a closed door, an adult is not going to try to have sex with the child. Think again, uh, the allegations about we Allen in the attic, right? Um, the taboo would facilitate rather than hinder this, and the, the, the taboo would be an internalization um, sufficient to not uh, uh, you know, force Mike Pence to say, uh, I can't be alone with a woman. If he could be alone with a woman but manage not to hit on her or even think of hitting on her, that would be a step in the right direction. Um, and so you then say it's the individual um, boss who uh, can make this kind of thing happen. My project was initially a project about Title VII and where this should fall uh, and how we should think about it from, from a Title VII enforcement perspective. Should we think about this kind of thing, uh, fraternization, as a sex discrimination problem? Um, should we think about sexual favoritism in the way that the EEOC does as a sex discrimination problem? And what I'm arguing is that to the extent the EEOC continues to promulgate and enforce these sexual favoritism norms, it's more likely that someone 
is not necessarily well-intentioned, but really is interested in avoiding liability, uh, may institute this kind of prohibition and enforce it in a workplace, even a workplace he or she controls. Yes? Um, I think this idea is really interesting because with everything going on in the Me Too movement, I thought about how I think norms really need to be changed in the workplace. And, and just like the examples you're saying, if you have a boss and they hit on you, whether or not it crosses the line into sexual harassment, it strains the working relationship and, um, and it disadvantages the woman in that situation. Um, but what I'm wondering is the difference between like right now, I think in most corporate culture, or depending on what company you're at, there is a culture of, that there shouldn't be a relationship between, um, I don't know the exact law, but between a subordinate and a management. But how do you go from there to creating an actual taboo? Slowly through, um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that the, it'd be interesting to see, for example, what the Me Too movement is going to be able to accomplish uh, along those lines. So, you know, law is a part of it, right? And having uh, sexual favoritism norms in place, having Title VII in place, having in government um, anti-fraternization, anti-nepotism rules in place, having in individual corporate workplaces, similar kinds of things in place, uh, having corporate culture, having trainings, having um, societal movements, you know, writing situation comedies in which this kind of thing goes wrong. I mean, yeah, Martha Minow of Harvard Law School is always when people are saying, well, you know, we need to change the law, says no, we need to change the, the cultural narrative. We need to write more rom-coms in which this kind of thing goes badly and fewer rom-coms in which this kind of thing goes well. Um, yes? Sure. Um, so I first brought this up um, at, um, there's a woman named Martha Feynman who is a major feminist legal theorist. She's moved around uh, from Wisconsin to Columbia to Cornell. When she was at Columbia uh, in the early 1990s, she ran a uh, workshop uh, on the centrality of sexuality in feminist legal theory. And uh, the overwhelming majority of participants at that conference uh, thought that sexuality was at the time quite central and that this was a good thing. And a minority of participants thought that sexuality was not as central as it should be. And I was in a tiny minority of participants who thought maybe sexuality uh, was a bit too central. And I raised the possibility, I mean, I, at, the point, at that point, it really was my idea, right? It was one of Virginia's best ideas, but <laughs> one of those things where you, you need to have, this, this is why preemption checks are important, right? This preemption check did not um, horrify me because my idea was not original. It encouraged me because, hey, Margaret Mead, uh, you know, an anthropologist, someone sophisticated in a wide variety of cultures. Uh, she's somebody I'm happy to hang my idea uh, off of and, you know, use her uh, credibility to uh, promote this. But so I, I put, for, put this forward and I got from the assembled feminist theorists the notion that this would be personally very limiting to them because eroticism, uh, they said, uh, or several of them said, uh, was central to their personalities, that they spent so much time at work, they had few places to express it outside of the workplace, and if they weren't able to be freely erotic in the workplace, then um, they were condemned to a life of celibacy, basically, uh, and, 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 uh, or a life of repression. Um, and others, and since then, uh, you know, best-selling academic books have been written on this subject have said that the teacher-student relationship is inherently erotic. Uh, and to remove eroticism from that relationship in particular is bad and dangerous. Uh, so, you know, Vicki Schultz is the, um, the modern uh, or the current day stand-in for the, or in the, in the formal written stand-in for, for those kinds of uh, thoughts. She doesn't necessarily agree with all of that, but she's, you know, because she sees herself as pro, pro sex rather than, you know, sex positive rather than sex negative, she would disfavor uh, a taboo that from her perspective is sex negative. 
Yes. I mean, again, so my project is to do this unified field theory of liking and non-liking. So I do not want this to be focused on sexuality. I want to be, it to be focused on differential, whether preferential or adverse treatment. And that includes both demands for friendship and um, offers of friendship on forbidden grounds that come with preferment. And, as I, and I think the latter is part of the, or can be made part of the current moment as well, because I think there is the notion that um, you know, the upper class straight white male Anglo-Saxon boss shouldn't only be golfing with people like him. Now when you say there's a, a, a movement away from this and it's at the level of government, I, I could be totally off base. Are, are you basically saying, Donald Trump? Yeah, I, I think okay. I, I also want to, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping in mind uh, Sally Yates' talk uh, earlier. Which I, I regret I did not hear, so can you and summarize she it? Spoke, I think, about the sort of erosion of governmental norms, sort of like the use of Twitter to subvert uh, rule of law in ways that should be, should be, I think it's because it was too strong of a word, but living in a time when Anything, anything goes, it just happens, and we accept it in the car. And she counseled us, don't, you know, don't allow that to happen. Sort of remind people of the norms. But I mean, we're living in a, in a culture where that's starting to be acceptable. It seems like a pushback against having the ability to institute this kind of control from above. The sort of using the law to institute such a taboo. So I just wondered if that kind of culture really inhibit I mean, I'm the last person anyone accuses of being an optimist. But um, I will say that so far, there has been a separation between what I agree with you is happening at the level of the presidency, where you know not only um, are these sorts of uh, taboos uh, not being honored or inculcated? But the taboos I started by analogizing them to, anti-nepotism, anti-fraternization taboos, are gone in a way that they have not been from uh, the executive branch and the federal government for a long, long time. But on the other hand, I think we've seen in corporate America um, so far, uh, a resistance to taking cues from uh, the executive branch about things like gay rights and trans rights. And you know, we can't, I think, can't, you know, count on even uh, the, uh, a Clarence Thomas EEOC regulation uh, to be enforced with the same uh, enthusiasm by the Trump EEOC. But this seems to me exactly why uh, a taboo at the level of corporate culture is important because in addition to changing the norms, uh, Trump is changing the uh, enforcement priorities and you know, for all, I mean, you know, this, this is a guidance, this um, uh, thing on um, um, sexual favoritism. 
it's possible that the Trump administration will seek to withdraw it because sexual favoritism does seem to be the kind of thing that Trump supports. Yes? Um, so I understand the uh, point about uh, fraternization and uh, the difficulty that it may pose for the third parties and, for example, a golf outing, so somebody. And that, but I wonder um, if the women's associations within corporate uh, firms uh, or otherwise could, like if the Anglo-Saxon straight male could come back and say, well, what about women helping each other up the ladder and that sort of fraternization? Is that a counter argument or is that? So, yeah, so I'm sort of old fashioned about these kinds of things. I'm um, anti-identitarian to use the jargony way of putting it. Uh, I think you should have, I think one should have rights not because of who or what they are, but notwithstanding who or what they are. So, um, you know, I, one of my first research assistants here who ended up being a uh, leading conservative uh, litigator, Alison Ho, um, was involved in projects when she was working for me and also an officer of certainly the Federalists and I think the Burke Society, which were opposed from a radical feminist perspective to women's groups. She kept telling the, fe the Federalist Society, you should not have women's groups, you should integrate women. I, that's for better or for worse the side that I am on. I, you know, I have sympathy with um, Wasserstrom, whom I said, you know, wants to analogize sex to race from a perspective of uh, race blindness. That is to say, he's, he's writing at a time well before critical race theory, imagining that of course everyone will agree on race blindness. The only question is, can sex blindness look anything like race blindness and should it? So I think of women's mentoring situations as far less ideal than mentoring situations irrespective of sex. They may be helpful as a transition device, but in my ideal world, they, like all sex-specific um, opportunities and institutions, would wither away. Now, you know, I, I also do the early history of feminism, so I know that feminists have tried to build an ideal world for, you know, literally half a millennium and each one thought this is the generation that will finally get there. So my ideal world may be beside the point. What I find interesting is that my ideal world is no longer a lot of other people's ideal world. I mean, I, I think of the women's mentoring, women mentoring other women in areas that are not sex specific, right? I mean, you know, if the question is, how do I integrate my uh, partnership track with my pregnancy? That's something different from how do I integrate my partnership track with my aversion to golf? Um, you know, if golf remains a, um, a male-only game. Let me take this opportunity to put in a plug for next week's workshop on regulating f family, sex, and gender, where somebody's going to talk about integrating golf teams in high schools, right? So golf. Um, is different from pregnancy. One is gendered and the other um, is sexed. Again, trans movement may have different things to say about it, but I'll start with that. And I would like gender to be disaggregated from sex in the end so that um, people who are interested in golf can be either male or female. Um, and the workplace opportunities that come from being a good golfer or uh, UVA students got jobs based on where they, uh, what, what positions they held in the administration and the playing of the softball league, right? That's gendered um, and might be less gendered um, in future. Nobody else with any other Questions, comments, yes. Oh, I was getting ready to apply. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. Um, have you heard of the uh, love contracts? 
Uh, I think I have, but there, there are two very different things I have in mind under this, so tell me what you're thinking well, of. I don't know that much about that, but I recently uh, talked to somebody who said their firm had love contracts for people who were going into relationships with somebody else in the firm, and then that would uh, relieve them from liability of a future sexual harassment claim. So I was wondering what your thoughts are about that. I know it's kind of tangential. But it, it actually is not so tangential um, in the sense that, so this is what um, I think a lot of uh, universities did in response to the kinds of questions earlier raised. So that uh, instead of, so what UVA did, as I said, was categorically prohibit sex with undergraduates. Uh, and there was much outrage about this on the part of undergraduates who said, you know, aren't we adults? Can't we make our own decisions? Uh, when, you know, German radio stuck a microphone under my nose and said, what did I think? I said, you know, Virginia is still a state with adultery laws. I think if we started out by prohibiting faculty from engaging in adulterous sex, that would take care of an awful lot of the problems uh, in this <laughs> regard. Um, but so what I know that some other uh, universities do is they allow um, faculty and students, especially faculty and graduate students, to engage in consensual sexual activity on condition that they disclose and that the student is counseled first. Um, I'm not inherently uh, opposed to this. I think it, you know, it's a sensible intermediate step. To, and again, part of my concern is that I think too much attention has been focused on the effect of these kinds of relationships on the subordinate actually involved in them. And what I'm trying to do is broaden the focus to the other people in the workplace who are not offered this opportunity uh, or who might not be offered this opportunity. Uh, I mean, I'm aware of, for example, um, graduate student supervisors who have a long history of, on the one hand, buddying around with uh, the men under their supervision, and on the other, hitting on the women under their um, supervision. Sometimes that's per se a problem, but some of them have a long history of productive consensual relations with those women whom they go on to mentor even when the sexual relationship stops. But there's a subset of women who are not the boss's type because they're not male and therefore not available to be his buddy and they're not the kind of woman he's attracted to, so not available to be his paramour, and they're you know, left out of both of these opportunities. And again, it's the third party I would focus on um, in addition to not instead of the subordinate actually in the consensual relationship who signs the love contract. Yes? Um, we've been talking a lot about ancestor taboos, like between mm -hmm. uh, supervisors and subordinates. And you briefly mentioned sibling taboos, and I was wondering, um, so I think it depends on how, I mean this gets to the unit cohesion point, how um, close and tight the, uh, the family as it were is. Um, a sibling who, you know, is a sibling type of relationship in the workplace involves uh, you know, very close working quarters and very small numbers uh, for me to worry about it as being um, up for this kind of taboo. Yes? So is your theory more based on the results or do the things like, would you care more about having like unitary preferences where everybody feels neutral about everything and take the same decisions? Would you also be okay based on theory if you just have like each person has completely different preferences and the results that ultimately is the same, so people have different approaches. They have the same opportunities but just different means. So again, I am narrowly obsessed with sex discrimination in this project. Other people may have other reasons for an incest taboo, and I'm here neither to uh, condemn them nor to praise them. What what I am concerned about is when decisions are made based on what 
um, in the Title VII jargon is called a forbidden ground. And sex is one, it's the one I'm interested in, but the other forbidden grounds include race, religion, national origin, um, ethnicity, um, color. So other kinds of purely capricious reasons for, I mean, not forbidden grounds because they're not systematically the basis for preferring or uh, disadvantaging groups uh, are less of a problem for me because I'm interested in anti-discrimination and equality of opportunity. If I were um, a management consultant, if I were designing a, a proper functioning workplace, I might also have problems with uh, what I'll call a capricious. You said you know, everybody has his or her own preferences. Um, I think that the thing about sex is that um, there's even in, in the new world of gender fluidity, more binarity in what's preferred, right? It's not that there are a, a thousand different bases on which one would prefer one sexual partner uh, over another. There are a thousand different sub-bases, but we are still starting, again, for better or for worse, in a world in which we are not all perfectly bisexual with an orientation toward one or another sex. And that already introduces the potential problem of sex discrimination. Does that make sense? Is that responsive? In, in part, what I think, like, if you imagine that there are corporate boards where, like, yeah. men like women, women like men, trans, like, trans, uh, uh, sorry, uh, homosexual people like homosexuals, and then they all have equal decision power, it's a very different mechanism in which everyone makes neutral decisions from one which everyone decides based on their own preference. And the results ultimately the same in promoting. I see. Particular preference in relation to this, for the person. So, so yeah. So one of the things you're you're uh, pressing me to clarify is that there is more to the employment relationship than up down employment decisions. There's more. I mean, this is what hostile environment sexual harassment points out. Quid pro quo sexual harassment is about the up down decision. You will get preferred if you engage in the sexual conduct. You will get dispreferred if you do not. What hostile environment says is that you know, the sea you swim in um, matters. And the sea you swim in may be affected by the, uh, the critical mass of preferences on the board level, if you, if you put it that way, even if the individual decisions uh, may be equalized out by everyone wanting to prefer a different kind of person. It may be that um, the way the firm feels to people who um, work in it may still be skewed, if that's comprehensible. Other questions, comments, expressions of outrage or puzzlement? OK, I guess I could cue the applause. <laughs>